Thank you for joining me for this virtual webinar. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about how to spot skin cancer early. I just wanna mention that our practice is called Stonegate Dermatology. We're actually located right across the street from the YMCA in St. Joe, um, kind of on the corner of Hollywood and Maiden Lane. I also wanna mention that at the very bottom of your screen, there is a button for question and answer. So if anyone has any questions at any time, please feel free to ask. Um, and at the very end of this presentation, there also is going to be a survey. There'll be a click uh, or a link rather that you can click on um, to do that, or you'll get a link in an email. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So the objectives of this presentation, we're really gonna review the three most common types of skin cancer, um, kind of go over their clinical presentation, uh, what puts you at risk for skin cancer and go over some treatment recommendations. Also, who should get a skin cancer screening and when and how often should you get one? And also what can you do at home to prevent skin cancer? Next slide, please. So the three main types of skin cancer are basal cell, squamous cell skin cancer, and melanoma, which is the one that we worry most about. Next slide. Basal cell carcinoma. So this is the most common type of skin cancer that there is. About 40% of the Caucasian population will get at least one of these in their lifetime. About 2 million Americans are actually diagnosed with a BCC every single year. Um, the average age is probably about 40. Uh, males are a little bit a higher risk than females. Next slide. So who is prone to getting basal cell carcinoma? So generally speaking, it's usually individuals that are fair skin. So people that um, tend to burn easily, especially if, if they have a history of more blistering type sunburns, uh, people whose skin freckles easily. Um, other risk factors include indoor tanning use, uh, ingestion of certain substances such as arsenic, um, prior radiation in the area that you get the skin cancer, and then there are some genetic syndromes that can be also linked to getting multiple basal cell skin cancers. Um, another thing I wanna mention is organ transplantation. So individuals that have had an organ transplant are actually five to 10 times at a higher risk of getting a basal cell than the general population. Next slide. So there are actually many different subtypes of basal cell. Um, the first four that are listed on this slide, superficial, nodular, pigmented, and morpheiform, these are actually named based on their clinical presentation. The bottom four, micronodular, infiltrative, adenoid, and basosquamous are actually more based on their patho uh, pathological description underneath the microscope. Um, superficial and nodular are the most common types of basal cell. Next slide. So here's an image of a nodular basal cell carcinoma, and this is the most common type. Um, generally, this will be a shiny, or sometimes we'll call it like a pearly pink papule. A papule just means uh, a raised lesion less than a centimeter in size. And often, as you look at this image closely, you'll see there are surface telangiectasias. Telangiectasia is basically a fancy way of saying kind of blood vessels or capillaries running over the lesion. Um, basal cells tend to bleed um, spontaneously, um, and then over time, they can actually start to scab and ulcerate. Next slide. The second most common type is a superficial basal cell. Um, this one can actually be a little bit tricky to diagnose sometimes because it can look like a pink kind of scaly patch on the skin. So a lot of times people will misdiagnose it and they will think that they have a little patch of psoriasis or a little patch of eczema and they'll be treating it for a long period of time. Um, things to remember comparing kind of a uh, dermatitis versus a skin cancer is skin cancer is asymptomatic. So usually eczema psoriasis sometimes can be itchy or can be burning. Um, skin cancer, you won't have any symptoms at all. Um, also, over time, the skin cancer will get larger in size, and then again, it may bleed or ulcerate. Next slide. So this is an image of a pigmented basal cell. This one's actually a little bit trickier to diagnose. It can often mimic a melanoma. Um, and as you can see in this image, it can be 
uh, multicolored. So it can be pink, blue, gray, um, and this is more commonly seen in darker skinned individuals. Next slide. This type of basal cell is called a sclerosing basal cell carcinoma. This is actually um, more scar-like in presentation. You'll often see kind of this white sclerotic patch. Uh, the borders will be more ill-defined. Um, sometimes these can be quite invasive and actually invade into the nerves. Next slide. This is actually a combination of both a basal cell as well as a squamous cell carcinoma. And then similarly, this can be quite aggressive in nature. Next slide. So how do you treat a basal cell carcinoma? So there is um, different treatment options. It really depends on the subtype of the skin cancer. Uh, it depends on the location, the size. It depends on if there is any invasion into deeper tissue or deeper structures. Um, the most common treatment, however, I would say is probably surgical excision. Uh, basically what that involves is that we usually take a safety margin around the skin cancer, um, and then you can't really stitch up a circle because it would kind of pooch at the ends if you tried to bring it together. So we do what's called a ellipse or kind of like a little football shape and we stitch it back up in a straight line. Um, another very common procedure that's done for basal cell skin cancers is something called Mohs micrographic surgery. This is kind of a skin sparing procedure used mostly for head and neck skin cancers uh, where you don't really have a lot of extra tissue. Um, and you kind of take the skin cancer in a stepwise process. And then once um, the skin cancer has been removed, depending on how large the defect is, uh, sometimes you can do what's called a flap where you kind of move the adjacent skin and slide it into place. Sometimes you might need to do a graft where you take a piece of skin from somewhere else and kind of stitch it on like a patch. Um, another treatment option for less aggressive um, and more superficial type basal cells is something called electrodesiccation and curatage. We call it EDNC for short. Uh, this is kind of like a scrape and burn type technique. Uh, we kind of scrape away the skin cancer cells. They feel a little bit different than normal tissue, almost kind of uh, gelatinous. Um, and then we actually do that several times and then cauterize the base of the lesion to destroy the cancerous cells. Um, the other treatment option is called cryosurgical destruction. Um, so we use something called liquid nitrogen in our office and we use that liquid nitrogen and when it reaches certain depths and certain temperatures, it can actually destroy cancerous cells. Um, for superficial basal cells, you can also do a topical cream called amiquamod, and generally that's applied at home for about six weeks. And then lastly, there's something called superficial skin radiation. This is actually a great treatment for individuals that um, might be nervous to do surgery, uh, where they're not really you know, apt to wanting to have any kind of cutting or bleeding. Um, also, more of our elderly patients that have a lot of comorbidities, um, radiation is a good treatment option for them. Uh, basically, they go and get this done at the main hospital here in St. Joe, um, and they they're have to do it for four weeks, um, but there have been very good results with it. Next slide. So kind of a take-home point I want to mention for basal cell is that, you know, being the most common kind of skin cancer that there is, it is a locally aggressive skin cancer. So the likelihood of a basal cell carcinoma spreading to the rest of the body is very low. It's actually less than 1%. Um, so uh, usually if you catch it early and get it treated, um, you know, it will be resolved and taken care of. Once you're diagnosed with a basal cell carcinoma, the recommendation is to get a full body skin examination every six months for the first two years after the diagnosis. And then if there has been no reoccurrence or no other basal cells found, um, then you can go to every year after that. Um, and the reason that you do frequent skin checks is for twofold. One, you want to see is your basal cell carcinoma coming back. Um, the local rate of recurrence is actually about 50% um, in the first two years and then about 80% in the first five years. The other thing is it's an indication that you have probably had a lot of sun in your life. And so it puts you at a higher risk of getting another basal cell. So about 15% of patients that have had 
one basal cell will develop another one within the year. And then actually 35% of patients that have had a basal cell will develop another one in the first five years. So as you can see, it's kind of important to come in and, and just get looked over. Um, and also, it also indicates that you're a higher risk of the two other skin cancers that we're gonna discuss next. Next slide. So kind of shifting gears a little bit, the second most common type of skin cancer is called squamous cell carcinoma. Um, generally, the lifetime risk is about 9 to 14% for males and about 4 to 9% for females. Usually, this occurs in later decades of life. And then similarly to basal cell, the likelihood of a squamous cell carcinoma to metastasize to your body is fairly low. It's a little bit higher than basal cell. It's about two to 5% of the time, depending on um, where it is located and again, how aggressive it is. Next slide. So the risk factors for squamous cell are similar. Um, there are some unique things though that I wanna also mention. So in addition to you know, sunburns, sun exposure, genetic predisposition, um, smoking actually increases your risk of squamous cells. Also uh, prior injuries. So people that have had burns, um, people that have had longstanding uh, leg ulcerations, that actually puts you at a 30 to 40% higher risk of developing a squamous cell in that area. Um, individuals that have had, again, certain chemical exposures such as arsenic, coal tar, um, certain genetic syndromes also put you at a higher risk of SCC. And then this is gonna be kind of mentioned again later on, but individuals that have had numerous precancerous lesions, which we call actinic keratoses, are at a higher risk of SCC. I also just wanna mention a unique SCC, which is called carcinoma caniculatum, which is kind of a verrucous carcinoma that is linked with the HPV virus. Next slide. So other risk factors include organ transplantation again. Um, and actually, this is a much higher risk than even basal cells. So individuals that have had an organ transplant are at a 65 to 250 time greater risk of developing an SCC than the general population. So actually, I have a lot of patients that have had organ transplants that come see me every three to six months for skin checks because of this tremendous risk. Um, individuals that have had uh, CLL, which is a type of leukemia, um, individuals with the recessive type dystrophic epidermal lysis bullosa, this is a genetic syndrome that actually um, has issues with blistering and scarring, can develop multiple SCCs, and then individuals with HIV AIDS. Next slide. So where are SCCs found on the body? So generally they're in sun exposed areas. Uh, usually they look kind of like a scaly or crusted papule. Occasionally they can be tender. Similarly to basal cells, they tend to be slower growing. Um, sometimes, like I mentioned, they can be in pre-existing scars, sores, ulcerations. Um, there are some unique types of SCC that I wanna mention. One is called a cutaneous horn and it actually looks kind of like what it sounds. There's a kind of thick horn growing out from the skin. Uh, and another type is something called a keratoacanthoma. This actually looks more like a little volcano growing out of the skin. So it's, uh, I call it a crater or form lesion, um, and they can be pretty rapidly growing. So I have patients that come in that they tell me, you know, within a month, they have this lesion that just seemed like it appeared overnight. Uh, they can often um, have drainage from them. They can be bleeding, um, ulcerating, that sort of thing. Next slide. So this is an image of a Bowen's disease, which is a superficial squamous cell skin cancer. Also, we call it a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Uh, and this one actually looks a lot like a superficial basal cell. Again, you wanna always make sure you differentiate between this and you know, making sure that you're not misdiagnosing it as like a dermatitis, like an eczema or psoriasis. Next slide. So this is an image of the keratoacanthoma. And as you can see, it kind of looks like this little dome shaped volcano that's kind of erupted from the skin. Um, interestingly enough, this type of skin cancer, some of the research shows that 
Um, it may have a potential for involuting. However, usually when we see this, we excise them. Next slide. And here's the image of that cutaneous horn. And like I said, it just, it looks like a horn kind of emerging from the skin. And they're usually pretty uh, firm and keratotic in nature. Next slide. Here's another uh, crusted papule to plaque with kind of an erythematous space on somebody's shin. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, precancerous lesions. So these are called actinic or solar keratoses. And usually we'll see numerous precancerous lesions in individuals. Um, most of the time, these are kind of these rough scaly spots. Uh, sometimes they're hard to actually see, but you can kind of feel them if you run your hands over your skin, they'll kind of feel very dry to the touch and, and they won't go away. So no matter how much moisturizer you put on, they won't go away. If you pick them off, they'll come right back. That's how you kind of know it's a precancerous lesion. Um, these usually occur on sun exposed sites. So most of the time I'll see them on the scalp, um, areas of the face, like the nose, cheeks, temples, forehead. There's actually a type that can occur kind of on around the rim of the lips as well, which is called actinic chelitis. Um, the dorsal or tops of the hands and the tops of the forearms are another very common location. And the reason that it's so important to um, diagnose and treat at this stage is that every individual precancerous spot has about a five to 10% risk of turning into a squamous cell skin cancer eventually. So the more of them you have, the more likelihood that you'll probably have an SCC at some point. Um, and generally there's different ways to treat precancerous lesions. Uh, very commonly we treat them with liquid nitrogen, which is called cryosurgery or cryotherapy. Um, there are certain creams that we can use as well. And we also do an in-office procedure called photodynamic therapy that can treat these. And so we wanna stay on top of these so that we um, lower our risk. Next slide. So treatment options for SCC. So again, very similar to basal cell carcinoma. Um, most commonly, we're going to excise these lesions. Uh, if they're in a more sensitive head and neck area, sometimes we can send them for Mohs micrographic surgery. Uh, we kind of went over um, cryosurgical destruction and E and E, D, and C earlier. Um, I just want to touch upon topical 5-fluorouracil cream. So this is actually a topical chemotherapy cream that we use for both um, precancerous lesions as well as superficial SCCs, and it's very effective, um, and it's something that's commonly given, and then radiation therapy. Next slide. So in terms of full body skin examination and follow-up, it's recommended that, again, every six months for the first two years after you're diagnosed with an SCC, and then every year after that, if there hasn't been any new lesions or any reoccurrence. Next slide. Okay. So the last type of skin cancer that we're going to talk about is melanoma. Now, melanoma is the I call it the scary type of skin cancer. So this is the type of skin cancer that you worry most about. Um, and the lifetime risk of having a melanoma is about 2.1%. Um, and sadly, the number of cases has been rising year after year. Um, the median age of diagnosis is about 60. Um, to kind of give you some perspective, in about 2016, there was almost 80,000 cases of melanoma in the United States. And the reason that this is the scary type of skin cancer is because this is the type of skin cancer, if you go undiagnosed or untreated, it can rapidly spread to your body and metastasize. Next slide. So the risk factors are um, a little bit different actually than basal cell and squamous cell skin cancer. So you can kind of think of basal cell and squamous cell skin cancer as more of the sun-induced skin cancers in a way, but melanoma can occur anywhere. So I always tell patients melanoma can occur even where the sun doesn't shine. So you want to make sure you're doing a very thorough examination um, of these individuals. So uh, increasing age is a risk factor. Um, anyone that's had a melanoma before is at an increased rate of getting a second melanoma. 
um, anyone that's had a basal cell or a squamous cell carcinoma also has an increased chance of getting a melanoma. Um, and then moly individuals. So the more moles you have, the more likelihood you're going to get a melanoma, especially the more atypical moles you have. So atypical moles are generally those moles that, you know, we call them funny looking moles. So they've got you know, irregular borders, asymmetric, sometimes they can be irregular shapes and colors. Um, and so that puts you at a higher risk as well. Uh, anyone that has a family member, especially a first degree relative, has a higher rate of a melanoma. Um, there are certain genetic mutations that can put you at a higher risk. Uh, and then of course, sunburns and excessive sun exposure does play a role as well as tanning bed use would play a role. And then interestingly, people that have had, or have rather Parkinson's disease are at an increased risk. Next slide. So melanomas can appear um, either on just normal skin. Um, so that's about 75% of the cases or about 25% um, of the time they can happen in a pre-existing mole or freckle. Um, and something I wanted to mention is a horizontal versus a vertical growth phase. So basically what that means is that what happens initially is that the melanoma is kind of growing horizontally. So it's um, very superficial in nature and it's kind of just gliding across the surface. Um, and when it switches from the horizontal growth phase to the vertical growth phase is when we worry. And we're gonna kind of talk about the different subtypes of melanoma here in a second, but um, you can see some of the subtypes are a little bit more aggressive because it's affecting um, your skin vertically. Um, so in terms of location for males, the most common location for melanoma is on your back. So every now and then you may wanna have somebody at home check your back. Um, and for females, it's the leg. And then, like I mentioned, melanoma can happen anywhere, even where the sun doesn't shine. So you can get an ocular melanoma. Um, often melanoma can metastasize to the brain. Uh, you can get melanomas in your mouth or the genital area as well. Next slide. So you can think of melanoma as kind of a haphazard of colors. So it can be any color, tan, brown, blue, black, red, gray. Um, there really is no uh, same description for melanomas um, for all of them. Uh, also, sometimes what you might see is you'll see areas of regression. So what that means is you might have a spot and it might have been, you know, different shades of brown, and all of a sudden you see part of the pigment disappearing, and it looks either like normal skin or it might look a little white or scarred. That is actually a bad sign if you see regression in a lesion like that. It means that it's progressing. Um, and then I just want to kind of go over the ABCDEs of, of both atypical moles and melanomas. And this is something you want to kind of tuck away in the back of your head as well to help kind of examine your moles at home. Um, the A stands for asymmetry. So if you made an imaginary dotted line across any lesion, it should look like a mirror image of itself. So um, it doesn't really matter if it's a circle or oval as long as it's a mirror image. The B stands for border. So you should have a nice smooth border all the way around your lesion. If you see any jaggedness or any irregularity, that's usually a bad sign. Um, the C stands for color. So you wanna make sure your lesion is one color. So again, if you see different shades of brown even, that can be concerning. Um, the D is diameter. This one's a little bit trickier. We usually say if it's smaller than a pencil eraser, it's okay. However, that's not always the case, but that's kind of just a general rule of thumb. And then E is kind of where you come in. So we always ask the patient, you know, is this evolving or changing from its baseline? Has it done anything? Has it started bleeding or scabbing or ulcerating? So anytime you look at any of your spots, just think of the ABCDEs and it can kind of give you a sense of, well, should I have somebody look at this or not? Next slide. So these are the types of melanoma, um, superficial spreading, nodular, lentigo maligna, and acrolentiginous. And these are just a few of the more common types. Next slide. So superficial spreading melanoma, this is actually the most common type of melanoma. It accounts for about 70% of the cases. 
And this usually happens in middle age. It can happen in both males and females. Uh, and again, this is the lesion that is the haphazard of colors. Um, this one is generally slower growing because like I mentioned, this will be in the horizontal growth phase for a longer period of time, hence why it's superficial before it changes to the vertical growth phase. So if you can catch it early and cut it out early, that's better. Next slide. So this is a nodular melanoma. And actually this picture is an overlap of superficial spreading as well as nodular. And this is the one that we worry about because here um, it's going to be rapidly growing. And so it means that it's switched to that vertical growth phase pretty fast. Um, and this will be kind of a, a brown, black nodule. Often sometimes people will mistake it for like a, a mole or a blood vessel growth or a scar. Um, and you wanna definitely catch this early. It accounts for about 20% of melanomas. Next slide. This is a lentigo malignant melanoma. This can be a little bit tricky as well. So a lentigo actually just means a sunspot. And as you get older, you know, we have lots of sunspots, but you're looking for the sunspot that doesn't really quite blend or fit in with the rest of your sunspots. Usually this type of melanoma is more on your head, neck, arms, so your sun damaged skin. Um, the average age is usually about 65. Um, and again, so look for the spot that doesn't quite fit. Next slide. So this is an acral lentiginous melanoma. Um, these are actually more common in uh, darker skinned individuals. So we'll see them in the Asian, African-American and Hispanic population. Uh, they can happen on the soles as well as the palms of the hand, as well as underneath the nail. So as you can see in this image, when you're looking at the nail plate, um, the streaks, you can see that there's different streaks of different colors. Um, also, there's different widths of them. And then we also look for something called the Hutchinson sign. Basically, if you start seeing pigment around the nail fold, that is worrisome. Next slide. And here's an image of a melanoma on the sole of a foot. Next slide. Okay. And this slide is just kind of mentioning some of the more rare types of melanoma. Next slide. So the treatment of melanoma is surgical excision. Uh, sometimes other treatments need to be done depending on the depth of the melanoma. So um, if it is reaching a certain depth, sometimes the lymph nodes in the region where the melanoma drains might need to be examined. And then depending on the findings of that, uh, for more invasive melanomas, they may need adjuvant uh, radiation, chemo, or immunotherapy as well. So again, very important to catch this early. Next slide. So for full body examinations, this is actually a little bit more frequent than basal cells and squamous cells. The recommendation is every three months for the first two years after diagnosis, then every six months for year two to five, and then if there's no reoccurrence or no new lesions every year after that. Next slide. Okay, so I figured for kind of finishing up here, let's play a little game. And basically, let's see what we learn. So um, at home, I want you to kind of test yourself and figure out, you know, is this a skin cancer or is this just a normal lesion? Next slide. So as you can see in this image on the left, there is a kind of skin colored, pedunculated, um, I call it a cerebriform lesion. And on the right, it looks very similar, except you can see there's some surface blood vessels as well as some areas of hemorrhagic crusting. So the one on the right is the basal cell skin cancer and the one on the left is actually just a run of the mill normal mole. Next slide. So in this image on the left, you can see that there's a shiny or pearly pink papule or bump. And again, you see those surface blood vessels kind of running through the area. And the one on the right, you can see that there's kind of these, there's actually multiple ones. There's these yellow to pink um, kind of uh, shiny looking papules. And so the one on the left is the basal cell. And the one on the right is actually something called sebaceous hyperplasia, which is just an enlargement of your oil glands. Next slide. So in this image, you have two lesions that actually look pretty similar to one another. They're both kind of these 
flesh colored to pink uh, dome shaped papules. Um, and I just added this slide for fun. It's kind of a trick slide. So these are actually both normal lesions. Uh, they're a type of mole called a fibrous papule that often occurs on the nose. Next slide. So in this image, you can see on the left, on the nasal crease, there's kind of a large kind of dome-shaped uh, cystic nodule with some brown hyperpigmentation. And on the right, you can see that there's a slightly asymmetric um, kind of black uh, to kind of bluish um, patch with almost like a brown rim around it. And, and hopefully you pick this up pretty fast. It's the melanoma on the right, and then the one on the left is just a normal mole. Next slide. So here on the left is a brown stuck on warty papule. And on the right, you can see a kind of a medium to dark brown asymmetric um, patch to plaque with irregular borders. So the one on the right is the melanoma. And the one on the left is actually a benign lesion called the seborrheic keratoses. We see a lot of these on individuals as they get older. Next slide. So here's another kind of tricky one. So the slide on the right, you'll see kind of a black nodule. And then the one on the left, you can see kind of a blue to black nodule with kind of a, an erythematous rim around it. So the one on the left is the melanoma. However, the one on the right, you know, is also very suspicious looking. Um, if a patient told me that this was something that was new, I would definitely do a biopsy to make sure to rule out a melanoma. It is actually a type of mole called a blue nevus that can mimic a melanoma, but it's benign. Next slide. So on the left, you can see kind of this crusted um, kind of pink papule. And the one on the right, you can see that there's kind of this a uh, verrucous crusted plaque with kind of a erythematous or pink base. So the left is actually a wart and the one on the right is a squamous cell carcinoma. Next slide. So here on the right, you can see there's a kind of pink to purple um, verrucous papule. And then the one on the left, you can see it looks very eroded. So the center is kind of ulcerated, looks very kind of moist. And then um, we call this a rodent ulcer. So you can see the edges kind of have this rolled border. Um, so the one on the left is a basal cell carcinoma. And then the one on the right is actually another wart. Next slide. So this one's kind of a giveaway since we did it earlier, but the one on the left is a cutaneous horn, which is the squamous cell carcinoma. And on the one on the right, um, we've seen this on the prior slides, it's a crusted papule, um, that's a wart on the right. Next slide. So here are two images, and when you see them really quick, it's hard to tell the difference, but if you look closely, the one on the left, there are these kind of uh, small pink kind of crusted verrucous papules, and it's actually someone that has multiple warts on the dorsal surface of their hand. And one on the right is actually an image of somebody that has multiple precancerous lesions or what we called actinic keratoses on their hands. So that again, the more of them you have, the more likelihood you get a squamous cell carcinoma. So you wanna make sure that you treat them. Next slide. So here's an image of uh, two nail plates, and the one on the right you can see is a single um, linear, very uniform brown streak. And on the one on the left, you can see that there's kind of a array of different shades of brown. There's even some kind of speckled areas of darker brown as well. So the one on the left is the nail melanoma, and the one on the right is actually normal. We see this sometimes in darker skinned individuals, especially, and it's called longitudinal melanichia. Next slide. So I think that concludes the presentation. I just wanted to remind everybody that there is a survey at the end. Um, also, if you are interested in getting a skin cancer screening, there will be two free skin cancer screenings this month. There's one in Niles, Michigan at the Lakeland Cancer Specialist in Niles um, on May 26th. And there is one at the Center of Outpatient Care in St. Joe on the 27th of May.
Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And we do have a couple of questions, Dr. Shaw, uh, okay. in the bottom chat, or I can read them out to you. Uh, I can click on it. Okay, so the first question is, how much sun exposure is too much exposure in one day? Um, so I guess I'm gonna answer this a little bit differently. So. Um, a lot of people will ask, well, how much sun do I need for vitamin D, for example? So you actually only need about 15 minutes of um, sun exposure for vitamin D. After that point, you really should be wearing sunscreen if you're outside. Um, the recommendation for sunscreen is to wear at least SPF 30. So it necessarily doesn't make too much of a difference if you, you know, wear 100 or anything like that. But if you're going to be out in the sun um, all day long, you do want to reapply um, every two hours. If you're swimming or if you're sweating, you want to reapply more frequently, maybe every 90 minutes. Um, and then generally, you want to look for sunscreens that will say zinc oxide or titanium dioxide on the back of the label. Those are more um, what we call physical blockers. So they will actually eliminate more of the UVA and UVB rays that you experience. So there's no such thing, I guess, as too much sun in a day. Maybe try to avoid the 10 to 2. And then otherwise, if you're out, just enjoy with SPF on. Um, the next question is, what areas of the head and face are prone to skin cancer? Um, I guess I usually see skin cancer a lot of times, um, especially on males, if they have um, no hair on their head, that's a very common location for skin cancer. Um, the nose seems to be very susceptible to skin cancer as well, but really any part of the, the face um, can be susceptible to skin cancer. Um, kind of along the lines of sunscreen, when you're outside, you may wanna wear a hat. And I usually tell patients, um, don't wear a baseball cap. You know, a lot of males will wear baseball caps, but that does not protect your ears. And I'll see a lot of squamous cells on the ears. Um, you really wanna get like a broad rimmed hat. Um, the next question is, what options are the best for monitoring age spots? Um, I think by age spots, I'm not sure if you guys mean sunspots or more like whiz, what I call wisdom spots, which are seborrheic keratoses. Uh, I guess the best way I can answer this is get a skin cancer um, screening once a year. I always think of it like you go to your primary care doctor once a year to get you know, an examination to make sure everything's okay. Um, come in for a look over. I usually, when I do my skin cancer examinations, I will tell you what is normal and what to look for. So that way, at least, you know, on your skin, you know, this spot is okay, or this age spot is okay. Um, and the last question is, how do I know when I should see a dermatologist rather than my family doctor or internist? Um, so hopefully this presentation helped you. Uh, I guess the biggest thing I want you to keep in mind is one, those A, B, C, D, E's of atypical moles and melanomas that we went over. So if you see any uh, asymmetric, multicolored, irregular bordered, you know, new or existing lesion, I would see a dermatologist. Um, and then also for basal cells or squamous cells, really think of those as non-healing wounds. So if you have a spot that you've had for, I usually say greater than a month or so, um, and it's not going away and it's getting worse, I would go see a dermatologist as well. Does anyone else have any other questions? It looks like those are all that we have entered in here for now. Okay. Thank you again, everyone.